Robert Halfon, always a busy man, but since you've taken up your new, new appointment as a Minister for Apprenticeship and Skills, has that kept you very, very busy? Well, I'm really lucky because I, I love my new job. I'm in charge of apprentices and skills all over the country, not just uh, helping in Harlow. Um, it's something I've always been interested in. Um, my, I asked uh, Harlow College how many times I'd been to visit as an MP, and they said in the past five years or so about 45 times. And I go because I love seeing what goes on there, and I get inspired by giving young people the opportunities. <laughs> what I call getting up on, on the ladder of opportunity, either doing technical education or doing an apprenticeship. So I've been going around the country seeing other good colleges as well. And I think I got up at four o'clock in the morning from Harlow. We drove to uh, North East, um, then all across the North East seeing three or four amazing colleges and companies that are employing young apprentices. Then that night from one end of the North East on the coast to the coast of the North West of Blackpool, and then the next day doing the same, and then down to see colleges in Cambridge uh, and in Suffolk, and also, perhaps the best part, was visiting a pub um, uh, owned by Green King, um, because they employ a huge amount of apprentices, and I met um, a whole team of them um, at, the, uh, at the pub in uh, Bowes and Edmonds. So you're seeing examples of good practice, but is that what exactly is your remit? I imagine you have quite a robust remit. So my job is to be in charge of apprentices in, in the country. We're looking at a number of things. One is about how to raise the prestige of apprenticeships and technical education. Um, secondly, I'm, uh, our manifesto commitment was to have three million by the end of 2020. We've got had 500,000 young people doing apprenticeships in the past year. Now that's a pretty amazing. Uh, statistic because the, what it also most apprentices, I think it's roughly 90%, uh, who complete their apprenticeship either stay in the company or get good jobs afterwards. So if you do an apprenticeship, in essence, you've got opportunities for life. Then I have to look after all the FE colleges, um, not just uh, Harlow, but also to see the ones that are succeeding. Most of our FE colleges are doing incredible work, some are having difficulties. Um, I'm trying to learn from best practice, but I'm also trying to go to FE colleges that aren't, let's say, doing as well as Harlow College um, because just to kind of learn what's going wrong and what we have to do to try and support them. And then there's the skills brief, looking at the kind of technical education that young people get and also careers. So um, I have to look at what kind of careers advice is being given to pupils and students all the way from primary school right up to post 16, 18. Um, and the careers are incredibly important. They're the first rung of the ladder of opportunity because if you don't get the right careers advice you don't know what education to do necessarily and you won't even know about the apprenticeships that are on offer. And, and switching, you've just returned from um, from conference and if, if anybody follows you on Twitter it looks like you're jumping, you're going from meeting to meeting but that theme that you have carried for a while of the Workers Party mm. and aspiration uh, you're very much much carrying that message to the, to the conference, is that right? Well I was really happy because um, to a Prime Minister in two speeches said that the Conservative Party is the true Workers' Party and that's something I've always campaigned for. A few years ago when I wrote about it in Harlow, the Harlow Star and in the Sun, I got called in by senior people and they, as the joke goes it's called a meeting without coffee mm. and I was told to stop doing this stuff and then we have the Prime Minister of our country getting up and saying that we are the true Workers' Party but it isn't just words, there's real substance uh, behind it. So. We're the part of the introducing national living wage, which means that pe people on low incomes will be about £5,000 better off by 2020. Um, we're the party that has raised the threshold to cut taxes for lower earners, so no one pays uh, any income tax until they earn over £10,000. We've created two and a half million apprenticeships in the last parliament, created more jobs than any time in, in our island's history, but we need to do a lot more, and that's what the Prime Minister was talking about. We need to make sure things are fair. Damien Green, something I was very happy about, said there would be no more um, testing for long-term disabled people uh, and I think we're going to make sure it's much more humane uh, and the whole idea of welfare reform is not about bashing people who have welfare but just trying to get money to those who need it most. What's it like being part of Theresa May's government? It's great, I mean it is different, um, she's pretty strong, um, there is no, no messing around. Um, She's a Prime Minister that just wants to get the job done. Um, I, as I mentioned to you, I'm really happy with the 
and Ministry of State for Apprenticeships and Skills, I've got a real chance to help, be one of the people helping transforming the life opportunities, the chances for millions of young people in our country, getting them on the ladder of opportunity, and either making sure they have a good technical education if they decide to stay at college and the skills that they need, or um, guaranteeing every young person a quality apprenticeship. I and mean, that is uh, a massive thing to have to do, but it is. I can say at the end of it that I've helped 100,000 people get good quality apprenticeships and skills and jobs, then uh, I'll have done it, you know, be pleased that I've done my job properly. I appreciate you've taken that back to, back to your particular remit, but there are people with some of the speeches, what Theresa May has been saying, Amber Rudd has been saying, sort of worried that you're trying to outkick UKIP, and I know you've never been a great fan of, of yeah. that sort of type of atmosphere. Yeah. Is that something you're totally comfortable with? Well, I don't accept that, that. I think that's a caricature of what um, Theresa May has been saying. I've always argued we, we need fair immigration fair to the, um, that's fair to the taxpayer. Whatever my own views on the EU, and that's well documented, I strongly believe, and I pledge this on the day after, I think I sent your Harlow a note on it straight after on the morning, referendum, we have to accept not just the result of the country, but also, as the Harlow MP, what the people of Harlow wanted. And they wanted fair immigration fair to the taxpayer. And I think that's what, what uh, uh, she is saying. And um, so she's saying we're going to be out of the European Union as the public demanded, um, and also out of this, this, this single market, which in essence said that anyone from Europe can come and stay here. She's not saying nobody can come and stay here, but she's saying it should be the British government, the British people, who decide who comes here and how many. Do you think your party now feels they've got carte blanche to say what they like because there is really, some say, a, not an effective opposition? Well, actually, I take a different view about this, and I, um, I said this in a speech at the conference only this week, that, of course, there are problems in the Labour Party. Of course, um, there is um, civil war in the Labour Party. However, uh, in my view, not everyone who's joined the Labour Party is from the far left. And there are many, uh, many, many thousands of people who've joined Labour who believe that they have a, uh, a noble cause, which is to help the underdog or to help people who are suffering. And I not only hugely respect that, I want people to see that we have a moral mission too. I'm not talking about private morals, I'm talking about um, that we are also there to help the underdog. We want to help struggling families. This is what Theresa May's speech is all about. And I saw her speech saying that we are the party of the workers, a party of people who are struggling to keep their head above water, they're doing the right thing, um, but we're also, uh, and, and in that, as I say, the party of the ladder of opportunity, but also the party of the social ambulance too, that we're there for people who either can't get on the ladder or who fall off the ladder, and that means being more compassionate on areas like welfare, and there was substance this week in, in what um, the Social Security Secretary said about disability benefit and making sure that it's fair, that the people, um, low-income people don't have to pay high taxes, uh, that rich people don't get away with paying uh, uh, taxes. Um, and I think there'll be a lot that comes out over the next weeks and months to kind of really give substance to what Theresa May was saying about being workers' party, being the party that's going to protect our NHS. We're sweeping through a lot of subjects, we've only got about three to go. Um, the grammar schools debate. Um, we put a piece on this morning about um, people like Karen Spencer and Vic Goddard have their deep reservations mm. about grammar schools. Slightly, the article was slightly elephant in the room because I was just wondering if they were referring to anything in particular. But how comfortable are you with the grammar schools debate? Well, if you're talking about um, recreating the grammar system of old, I wasn't around then. I can understand um, people being concerned about it, but all of that, as I, I mean, we're going to find out in December because as thing called a green paper which means a lot of consultation um, up until the end of the year as I understand it. What, what um, they're actually saying is if parents, particularly parents in deprived areas or um, want to send their kids to a selective school why should they not be given that choice? Now it doesn't mean, what they, it's not by itself because what they're also saying is that private schools have to do more to help state schools in area, particularly in the brothers, also urging universities to do more to help state schools and even run some academies, and it happens already in parts of the country. And what, the, what um, under the new proposals, it's not just saying let's have a grammar school and just so middle class people can join a grammar school, what it's saying is that grammar schools should be focused on areas that have, uh, are not necessarily on high income, 
that they should be uh, the, the, there should be a significant portion of people of, of low income that they should have the choice, and that independent schools and universities also have a role to play in making sure that people from deprived backgrounds have the best quality education. So let's see the final proposals. I'm not against people giving choice. By the way, I've had emails, uh, even a few from, I had one from a single parent, I had others from families. One, one said, when will this open? Because I, they, this is a single parent on low income, they would love to do it. I'm not saying every school should be a grammar school. I don't know even if we'll have one in Harlow or not. I'm completely open-minded, because my view, it should be up to the parents to decide what kind of school they want. We've already increased, we've done a huge amount to increase stands. If you compare stands in Harlow schools to 10, 20 years ago, it has been transformational. Burn Mill School, which is now Multi Academy Trust, was getting 25% A to C. It's now getting 85% grades A to C. Passmore is doing huge amounts, getting fantastic results A to C. Uh, a million children in our country are now part of good or outstanding schools. Uh, our primary schools have hugely improved, um, partly because they're now uh, academies and free to uh, have more freedom to do the things they need for their pupils and, and the parents. We're going to have a free school, uh, which is about to open. We've got our university technical school. You know, we are improving, we're giving an educational choice for everyone. If you want a technical education, you apply for the Harlow UTC. Um, if you want to a more academic route, you might apply for Burn Mill uh, or, 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 or Passmore's. Um, you know, we have to, I do think that the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge came to Stuart's, not just because they wanted to see uh, uh, one of many examples, it's because Stuart's school is leading the way with um, um, the well-being, emotional needs and mental health needs of pupils. So parents will choose, uh, well, some parents will want selective to, to have that chance, some people will want in their part to pass this way to, some will want to go to Stuart's for the reason I've just described, some will want to go to Amherst, some will want a, 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 a religious, more religious background so they'll go to uh, St Mark's and others will want to go to Mark's. Pe 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 each parent will take a different choice, but why deny parents of low-income backgrounds the chance, if they want to, to go to selective school? No one's going to force parents to apply that. You love talking up Harlow and it comes very natural to you. Did you find the weeks of firefighting and defending Harlow in relation to what happened in the stove, did you find that quite difficult? Yes, because um, it's a very hard balance because I believe, I've always said this, uh, I love Harlow, I'm proud of Harlow, as you know, I've said it to you many times, and we have incredible things, but I also believe you can't sweep problems under the carpet, and if we have to be open about those. The difficulty for me as MP for the town is how do you talk about the problems without seeming like you're doing, uh, you're making Harlow look negative. Um, and so I try and juggle that all the time. I still think we're the best town in Britain to live here. I couldn't, I was in Birmingham uh, for the conference, a perfectly nice place, but I thought I can't wait to get home. And it was so nice, that when I, when, whenever I drive back to Harlem and you see the church and the water tower, I always know, thank God, I'm, I'm at home, as the sign that you're, you're at home. And, um, We've got, we're, in, we're doing this video in the leisure zone, one of the best in the country. Uh, we have Harlow College, one of the best in the country. We have uh, a UTC. We have about to have Public Health England here. There's an exhibition going on downstairs, half a billion pound of investment, bringing thousands of jobs, thousands of scientists to Harlow. Enterprise Zone. I met with Raytheon, the party conference. They've just uh, almost finished building a 25 million new plant in Harlow. 25 million. Arrow Electronics, 20 million. Harlow Enterprise Zone is also going to have Europe's biggest data bank. Uh, you know, and when you tell tech people that, they are amazed. Uh, so a lot of good things happening. And um, having said that, where there are problems, I believe I have to talk about them. People may disagree with me, but it's my duty because if you don't, if you just try and sweep them on the cover, we'll never solve them. And so when things go wrong, which they do, and it was difficult, there was like a black cloud over Harlow. Um, uh, we talk about it, we confront it, we deal with it. But where I do get annoyed is the people who only talk about the problems, or exaggerate the problems, or do down our town and go to one little bit, they'll see a concrete car park and say that's Harlow, and they've not even seen all the good things that we have to offer.
And finally, about good things, you know, we're interviewing here on a, on a Thursday lunchtime, but this evening, Harlow District Chamber of Commerce Business Awards and also Heart for Harlow. And those are real, Harlow's very good, like the Active Harlow Awards on Monday evening. Harlow's very good at celebrating what it does well, but also has good reason to celebrate it as well. So I've always thought that what makes Harlow a special place is sometimes we haven't been as rich as other towns, although that's changing with all the things I've just described. But actually, we have huge levels of social capital. And what I mean by that is the amount of community, the strength of community, of neighbourhood groups, of residents associations and charities and the faith communities. It is amazing what goes on here. The Heart for Harlow Awards was set up by the town chaplain. Not many other towns, by the way, have a chaplain who are across town. I always say to him, he's like an MP, because wherever I go, he goes. It's called Robert Finlay. And he has set up with his team, Heart for Harlow, nothing about Bible bashing or anything like that, but what it is, is to bring people together, to strengthen our social fabric, to strengthen our community. And what is brilliant about what he is doing tonight is he's bringing together the community side with the business side. So economic and social capital together hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. And tonight is not just about awards for incredible businesses and charities and organisations. It's actually saying, if you have just economic capital, you have no society. If you just have social capital, then you, have, you don't have the wealth that you need to create the economy and the jobs that we need. And he is, that Heart for Harlow uh, and with the business community symbolises the two coming together. And so it will be a, a, a good evening where we celebrate the best of both, uh, both our community organisations and our best businesses in our town. Robert Halford, thank you very much.